Hey, welcome back to the Football Die podcast where Liverpool are the Community Shield winners. Actually, that's not the headline this week, is it? No, England's Lionesses are European champions. That's the headline and that's where we'll start talking today. And even more euphoria, I'm joined by both Miles and Dave for the first time in what feels like an absolute age. Welcome back, guys. How's it going? It's good, man. Good to be back. Glad to see you both uh, back in action. Did you see the Lionesses? What did you reckon? I'll start with you, Miles. Felt like a bit of a turning point, didn't it, really? Wembley Stadium absolutely packed out and doing what the men's team couldn't do just a year before and actually winning the European Championships. What an amazing feeling. Yeah, incredible. And for 87,000 people to be there to witness it, it feels like a huge step in the right direction for women's football as well. It was it was excellent. It was a cagey affair at times. It was just as nervous as I remember us feeling when it was with the men's side against Italy. And there were mm. times when Germany were on top, but the Lionesses really came out the, the real overall winners with some real grit and determination that I think Weidman has done really well to instill in this team. I think if you remember that the last tournament the Lionesses were at, they had Phil Neville in charge. This shows yeah. what a capable coach will do. They were so well organised. They were so prepared for whatever Germany had to throw at them. And I think Weidman's changes really helped control the game. It was scrappy. Don't get me wrong. There were yellow cards flying everywhere. And I think having the experience of someone like Jill Scott come on, who I think was in a, a final 13 years ago. And yeah. again, yesterday, she was absolutely fantastic. Got a bit of a soft spot for her for her time at Villa last year as well. But just the quality of the game yesterday was so good to watch. And, and the fact that it means so much to not only those players, but everyone in England that was watching it. And a huge step forward in, in women's football in this country, considering it's... It's not that long ago since they were under a 50-year ban. It's just, it's yeah. fantastic that they've managed to, to win a major tournament. And with the with the first goal in particular that was just so classy and the second goal bringing on such an iconic celebration, it, it, it feels like a brilliant, brilliant step forward, definitely. Yeah, I think every step of the way of the final and to, to be honest, the whole journey to the final as well, it's felt like something in the water is meant to happen for this team. And uh, it's... It's just absolutely insane to think of the impact this is going to have on the women's game. My daughters were watching it with me back home and, uh, yeah, they were absolutely off their seats. To see a Wembley Stadium as full as it was, to see, what, 17 million viewers back home as well watching it on telly, that's kind of the numbers you see for men's games, isn't it? And mm -hmm. to see that kind of equality um, and the same kind of interest in the game is, is just insane, isn't it? Dave, do you think this momentum can continue for the WSL and, and the women's game? Do you think... Play, like supporters are going to go out and actually pay to watch the women's game week in week out now hopefully that's the case yeah i mean you'd like to hope so of course i think in terms of the actual event itself i can't remember you know a women's uh, competition having this much buzz surrounding it particularly the Eng women's england team uh, i know myself obviously a few of my friends who haven't really watched a lot of women's football in the past have given this a lot of attention so I think that goes a long way to say um, how much, you know, attention it has kind of managed to to garner. And, uh, I, I, you know, the achievement itself is mammoth-like in terms of what it does for the game and the, the kind of people that it, it does attract. And um, it, was a, it was such a good final, obviously, on the edge of your seat kind of stuff. England obviously don't always do it the easy way, um, as we know. And uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I was just glad to see it not to go to penalties because I mean, we know how we tend to fare in there. <laughs> well, having said that, if the players were absolutely exhausted, you know, yeah. I think they would have taken penalties in the end uh, just because they didn't have much energy to go any further. But as soon as that second goal went in. It was just manic, wasn't it? The celebration seems like it's going to be an iconic one now. And she nearly didn't take a shirt off thinking, if this is disallowed, I'm going to look stupid. But no, it went in and, and you didn't ever feel like England were going to lose that lead with a few minutes to go. They they managed the game so well, so well didn't they, Miles, in the end? Yeah, I think that, that last six minutes or so, the ball was in the corner for the majority of it and they were really trying to manage the game well. And again, that's a good coach showing their team how to, to get it done. And it was a brilliant moment for Chloe Kelly. Uh, it, it's fantastic. Now, 
this isn't someone who is necessarily a household name or yeah. the most obvious name on the team sheet for England. It, it wasn't even like it was an obvious thing that she would make the squad. And now all of a sudden she has the most iconic moment in, in the England national team's women's history, undoubtedly. And it's fantastic. There's a lot of depth in that squad. And you think that Nikita Paris was on the bench and that's someone that we've got used to. And you've seen the evolution of this squad yeah. now and how much the talent is coming through. This is a talented squad in a home tournament. They should have gone as far as they did. But the fact that doesn't always mean as much in international football, especially in knockout football. So they've, yeah. they've really done something here to achieve it. And I, I, I think it's lovely seeing not only the support of people at home, but then the men's national team as well. I saw Harry Kane tweeting Ella Toons congratulating her on what an amazing finish it was, which it, it really was. That little dink over the keeper. To do that in a final, the composure that shows, I think it's the highest attendance for any European final ever, men's or women's. And she was able to do that in a pressurised moment. It was absolutely fantastic. And you've hit the nail on the head that it's just got to mean more support going forward as well now. I mean... The WSL is so accessible to us. My yeah. wife and I have booked our tickets for Villa's first home game of the season today, which I'm really looking forward to. I mean, they're definitely going to lose. They've got Man City, typically. But, <laughs> but it just means I can be disappointed by two Aston Villa teams <laughs> in one season instead. But I do think it's important that we do get behind it now and we really appreciate the, the step that it's taken forward because the standard yeah. and the quality that they showed and the passion behind it, that's a brilliant thing to capture. And the atmosphere around it is so precious to us. When you think of all the chaos that we had in the men's final last year and how the fans treated it, and then compare that to the atmosphere around the final yesterday, yeah. that's something I want in football, definitely. You talk about your daughters growing up watching that. That's what we want to foster. So, yeah, I think all of us here at the Football Diary really would, would encourage people to go to the WSL where possible. It's really yeah. accessible. I think it was £10 a ticket for us. Amazing. I'm never paying that for a men's top flight game. No, but that's the thing. You talk about the the quality. I don't think many fans of the men's game have realised how good quality the football is at the top of the European game, especially. Yeah. I know the rest of the world's kind of catching up, but European teams are generally fantastic. I mean, the Germany team we beat, I've got such a good record in this yeah. tournament in particular. The Sweden team, we just brushed aside in the semi-final. Mm -hmm. they, we rarely beat that Sweden team. You know, they want to yeah. be elite teams of, of world football. So, yeah, we can't understate how much quality has, has, has gone into this England team. And to think Phil Neville was the, the coach last time we were in a major tournament with them. And uh, it was almost like a glorious failure, wasn't it, in the semi-finals yeah. there. I don't doubt if we rewound that and put Serena Riegman in charge for that game and mm -hmm. um, played it again, that it'd be a different story. It's just a different mentality, wasn't it? A high-level elite coach like that coming in and just transforming a very talented team, which is great to see. But we, we're not going to pretend to be like experts on women's football either. But we're sitting up and talking about it now at the top of our show. So for me, Dave, that kind of sort of says where it's become sort of a bigger thing in our consciousness and football fans generally. Do you think you'll see yourself going to a WSL game anytime soon? Oh, yeah. I mean, my obviously, as, as we both know, United didn't have a, a women's team until, you know, two years ago, which is quite yeah. frankly astounding, really. Um you know, for what we stand for as a football club. Uh, so, I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to go and see a, a winning game. I mean, can't, seeing that happen, especially at the weekend, only, really, any more, it just kind of magnifies, you know, how huge. And mm. it's been such a, I think, a big missed opportunity, I think, really, for for this country and, and the people that should be sort of witnessing um, these moments and um, hopefully now this has only kind of magnified it like you said and mm. identified that there does need to be more investment in you know certain areas and um, hopefully we start seeing more more girls in particular coming up and playing more, mm. more women's football um, but yeah like you mentioned there I'd, I'd, I'd love to go and see United game and I've been keeping track of sort of obviously players that have been signing in the transfer window as well um, mm. which I would normally have done uh, in the past so um, yeah I mean I've got two teams to look out now <laughs> Well that's the thing it's the awareness of the game in popular consciousness isn't it and media outlets haven't traditionally reported that much on the WSL 
but you'll find there's a whole podcast dedicated to it now. There's, you know, entire sort of sections on, on websites dedicated to the women's game. And to see the kind of interest in it that this finals generated and this tournament's generated kind of makes you feel like it's a lot more equal now than it ever has been. So, yeah, wicked to see. And I just hope it does kickstart kind of an attendance surge in women's games because... The English team has always kind of sparked the imagination for the last decade, I think, in, in, in England. I think the last time we played in the World Cup in, what, 2019, I've never seen that much publicity around them until this yeah. this year, really. Uh, but this is another level, isn't it? And that created a bit of a, a kickstart in the kind of players that WSL teams were, were buying. We're buying some of the biggest names in European football all of a sudden. But this is just going to take it to a, a whole other level. So, you know, The exciting thing is really, as well, is you look at, I mean, Miles mentioned the depth that that England has got. Yeah. Look at the likes. There's a few members in there, quite senior members, the likes of Ellen White, who you can't probably imagine will be there at the next World Cup, potentially might be as a substitute mm. um, or someone to bring on off the bench. But you've got the likes of Alessia, Alessia Russo and, you know, mm. um, Ella Toon, who could easily have been in that starting line or every time they came on the yeah. pitch. You know, they offered something completely different, a different, a different um, kind of dimension altogether. And how many times did we see them come on make and make a difference? And that I think that should speak volume, really. How promising this England team is. Mm. It can only get better from here, really. When you consider that we've had a lot of conversation about the fact that the Premier League has moved to five substitutes this year as well, Vibman showed exactly how to utilise that. Her lineup was the same for, for every game. The substitutions were pretty much exactly the same as well, but yeah. always changed the game in the right manner. You mentioned Russo there. I, she could have scored another one in extra time, but again, a great tournament with a lot of impact, mostly from the bench. That, that, that's a really nice thing to see an international team manage to do. When you look at the men's team, you often question whether Southgate knows his best 11 and whether that costs England. Well, there's no doubt that Vibman has got a mm. wonderful attitude throughout the squad. I think I think it was fantastic to see. And the celebrations think, yesterday were just, they were incredible. Yeah, I think when you mentioned there, there was consistency. You know, I wouldn't even say, I'd argue that that probably wasn't England's best 11. I'd probably say Russo is a better player than than Alan White is nowadays, but Maybe, they yeah. really had a plan and an idea. And you looked at even the substitutes, they came on around the same time, pretty much every game, around yeah. the 60th minute, you know, 60th minute. Mm. So, I mean, you've got to give her a lot of credit, really, that the plans, it's worked. Uh, yeah. I think what a captain Leah Williamson's turned out to be as well. I thought she yeah. was an absolutely fantastic example. And defensively, so sound. In fact, England's defence... It's just so formidable, like Millie Bright, Lucy Bronze as well, mm. all kind of at the peaks of their game. And uh, yeah, it's hard to find a weakness in that team. And when you look at the bench as well, I, I just think the confidence that all those players have had unleashed in them by this coach is is the thing that I noticed. To, you know, to try a lob in a European Championship final is insane. To try a back heel through the keeper's legs in a semi-final, you know, yeah. the quality of the goals is there because they've got the confidence to try it and the freedom to do that. And I think that's one difference between the women's game and the men's game. The men's sort of players feel, I think, a lot more under pressure. I can't see someone like maybe Raven Raheem Sterling is probably the exception to this, but every other England attacking player, I think, would really feel wary about trying something crazy in a final or a semi-final for fear of messing up. And we saw yeah. what missing a penalty did to the players that missed it in the final for the men's team a year ago. I think they feel like risk is too too dangerous for them for fear of a backlash. But the women's team had no such work, like concerns about that, which was great to see. I just wish the men's team could take note from this and look at the kind of freedom they played with and went, do you know what, we can do that as well. It's a really excellent point. And with a, with a tournament this year, the example has been set. And what a year for English football it would be if we could back up a women's Euro victory with, with the men performing well in the World Cup too. And that atmosphere around the Lionesses camp does remind me of the, the attitude that England players take on to their international duty on the men's side as well. And it yeah. was really interesting seeing them link the two and seeing both teams kind of training together mm -hmm. at times. I know like Phil Foden's been doing a lot of training with the women's team over the summer as well. They've been linking up a lot. And I like the idea that the national teams have got that unity. And what better example could you follow than, than like you say, the freedom that the women's team has just played with. Yeah. It's just, it was brilliant to watch. Yeah. So congratulations to the Lionesses. It's uh, hopefully the start of a new era for women's football in this country, definitely. And uh, 
We'll try and be part of that, I think, to do our bit to raise the game as well. I think this podcast could do a lot more to talk about women's football now. So look out for that, hopefully. Um, but moving on to the only real men's highlight we've had so far is the start of the, the football league season, obviously. But the Community Shield is the the big one, really, the curtain raiser for, for the Premier League sides. And it, was, it wasn't a disappointing game at all. It was quite an exciting end-to-end, anything but a friendly kind of game, really. And two... Brand new strikers on the pitch, um, Darwin Nunes coming off the bench and Erling Haaland, both adding a very different dimension to each of those teams who are pretty well established as well. So fascinating to watch. Miles, what was your takeaway from the game? I think it was it was a very good community shield. You often see those games kind of be a bit of a slog and then nil-nil, but Liverpool and Man City kept their normal competitive nature and, and that that really helped. One team was a lot further along in their development and obviously a lot further through their pre-season than the other. And that showed Liverpool Mm -hmm. weren't perfect. They they looked sloppy at times in certain areas, but City just did not look ready for it. And particularly with a change in system, like you mentioned, it was so clear that they had just gone a year without playing with a number nine. The yeah. amount of times Haaland made a run and no one was looking for that run and the ball came across the pitch instead. That's going to be something that they've really got to identify and work on quickly. But bear in mind, the last two seasons, City have not started quickly. It's taken them time to find their stride. Chelsea were running away with it last year. And then City come back and they find their feet. And I have no doubt that that will happen. But for a team that has spent a whole season without a central striker and then ended the game with two central strikers on the pitch, they didn't really look like they knew how to locate that. And that really was the difference between the two teams. Firmino is never going to be your out-and-out goal scorer like Nunes is, but at least he's still a central figure. So Liverpool knew how to provide for Nunes and that helped. A lot of people have talked about how great Nunes was. His movement was strong. He took his goal well. I thought the rest of the game he was terrible. He probably should have scored three at least. The, where, where he won the penalty, he's very fortunate because he's, he's headed the ball towards goal and it's gone across the six-yard box. Yeah. It was terrible. And there was one where Henderson played a ball through to him. And granted, like every pass Henderson played in this game, it felt like he overhit it and didn't find it perfectly. But a one-on-one, he, he hits Edison instead. And you think it will take him some time to get that sharpness. But that goal is a monkey off his back. All of a sudden yeah. now, there is positive talk about him. He had that friendly against Man United where he was kind of mocked. Then he went and scored four against Leipzig and now he's got a goal in English football. So that's a big weight off his shoulders. Whereas Haaland now feels like the guy with a point to prove. And Mm. that's probably harsh because he's such a a world-class footballer. But that's how it goes in English media with football and they'll have to get used to that quickly. Yeah, they're both going to fluctuate between between being like world class and the worst signing of the season, aren't they? Various points during the next few weeks, I think. But uh, interesting to see the dynamics change in both teams, Dave. I mean, they were focal points, weren't they? City struggled with that extra focal point because they never have one, like Miles was saying. But Liverpool seem to embrace having a forward to actually find on the end of long balls someone that they've not really had before either. I mean, there was Mane who, you know, Brought so much to that team. But the dimension that Nunes brought, I thought was, it needed some work. It's not perfect. It's not the finished article by any means, but it's definitely something that Jurgen Klopp can work with, Dave, surely. I mean, it's, let's not pretend that this is something that's completely new to Liverpool. See how direct that they can be over the, the all these diagonal balls, these balls over the top that we've seen the likes of, you know, Salah and Mane chasing through onto. Um, they're a completely different team to what Man City are. Man City, as we've seen over the last few years, they do obviously um, approach, have a different approach to play altogether to, to Liverpool. They like to obviously pass their red through into the channel, making those runs and you know, playing in behind. And obviously, in terms of what like we're speaking about, Liverpool, the players they've had in the past, they've had Divock Origi, who's you know, played a similar sort of particular role he likes to kind of have the ball in the feet um he obviously will attack those balls uh, those crosses and that's something that probably Liverpool aren't, aren't obviously completely alien to and mm. how they're able to adjust to to Nunez obviously it's too early to say how good he's going to be um I think like Miles said he's going to need time to 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 adapt to to English football because it's going to be complete completely different kettle of fish to you know, Portuguese football. We've seen it over the years, how many promising 
strikers that have come to the league and not quite now, quite being able to cut in. Um, like you mentioned there, I think there are probably a, there's a few a few flaws in his his technical game. Um, he, he's not quite. I think he's been mocked a little bit. Everyone's been saying he's the new Lukaku to come into the league, but I mean, he's oh, let's not forget he's very young. He's still got a lot to offer. He will definitely score goals in this Liverpool team just for the sheer amount of chances that they do create. Let's let's not forget that but they can be. Um, but I do think he's going to be a different kind of player to Haaland. We've seen how good technically Haaland is. Uh, I, I haven't got any worries about him. Yeah. Uh, obviously, especially being a United supporter, I wish I did have worries about him. But um, <laughs> he, you know, he guarantees goals. They'll both score goals, but I just, you know, they're different. They're different strikers. Uh, but yeah. it's, it's exciting to see the next, you know, the next month or so. See how they they start and begin the campaign. Um, yeah, I think the Premier League's uh, much better league for having them in, especially Haaland, mm. who's just one of the best, isn't he? But um, yeah, I don't think this game's indicative of what we're going to see too much from them at all. And I think it's hard to read into the Community Shield generally, isn't it, as a kind of an indicator of how the season's going to go for the two best teams by far in the league. Um, so that, I suppose that leads me on to my question for you, Miles. Does this pull them further away, having these players? If we haven't seen some of the players that they've signed yet. Uh, Calvin Phillips, don't know what dimension he's going to add to City mm. as well. But I thought they did look a cut above. Like there was a different dimension there that needed some polishing, but it's evolving the teams further. They're not sticking to the same tried and trusted script anymore. Guardiola's going for a player he doesn't normally go for. Mm. Same with um, with Klopp to an extent, both very young as well. What, 22, 23? How much do you read into this? I mean, it was weird as well. It was at the King Power Stadium, wasn't it? So <laughs> that felt like a different occasion as well. But what did you read into it, if anything? There were definitely some key takeaways for me on, on the game on where both sides need to develop. As you said, we've seen Guardiola kind of clash with number nines before and not really operate with them in the way that you would expect. So yeah. it will be interesting to see him adjust to having such a focal point in attack and someone who is a world-class superstar already, even if he is as young as he is in Haaland. I think it's funny because there's been a lot of talk on the two number nines, but not much talk about the one who did score for Man City. I thought Julian mm. Alvarez looked really, really good when he came on. He took his goal well. It was a good striker's instinct. And and he could be a, a massive part for, for Man City's success this year. I think it sounds odd to say, but seeing Man City line up, tactically they need to change but their squad is ready for this season definitely they won't yeah. need much more business maybe a left back if they're looking at Kukurea Liverpool on the other hand I was talking to a, to a friend of mine yesterday who's a Liverpool fan unfortunately yeah I am friends with Liverpool <laughs> fans even if I try and avoid it and one thing that I really took away from this game was I just did not think their midfield looked up to it in certain times Thiago is a fantastic player Fabinho is a fantastic player it looked a step above Henderson, in my opinion. And the other thing that really stood out to me was the same old argument that we have all the time at how poor Trent Alexander-Arnold is defensively. Yeah. Either, if you can, Mike, insert the video into this or we'll put it on the Twitter or something and just watch Trent's defending for City's goal. It is absolutely shocking. He loses the run of Foden in the first place, then covers the goal line but thinks it's offside so literally stops playing and turns his back on the play. While Adrian is fighting for the ball with Foden, Alexander yeah. Arnold's not even looking and then all of a sudden the ball's in the back of the net because he doesn't have a defensive instinct. What he does have is an incredibly creative instinct. That's what Liverpool are missing in their midfield right now. It yeah. seems so obvious to me that at some point in his career, if Liverpool can bring a new right back in, and make Trent Alexander-Arnold Jordan Henderson's replacement as a deeper-lying yeah. playmaker, that will benefit everyone. I, yeah. I, I cannot see how he's not there already. If you look at what he can contribute from a right-back position attacking me, give him the freedom to stay forward and do that. Don't rely on him to come back and defend yeah. an attacking winger because that's where they're going to get caught out. It happened in the Champions League final and it happened in this game. Fortunately for them, they scored three times. And that was enough to, to, to kind of get rid of that mistake. But I just think that for Liverpool now, they've really got to focus on how they improve that midfield and whether Trent is good enough defensively. 
Mm. There's the Trent one's interesting, yeah. The Trent one's an interesting one because, yeah, we if you put a highlights reel together of his defensive misjudgments, let's call them, there are quite a few and they seem to yeah. appear in these big games more often, don't they? And mm. I think it'd be interesting to see how Liverpool got on without the centre-backs they've got because they've saved their skin so many times, haven't they? And they've got good reserve centre-backs as well. I think Klopp recognises that the midfield's poor as well for that reason and that's why he's got such good centre-backs to kind of make up for that. But uh, do you concur with that, Dave? Do you think Liverpool look weaker in the field? Trent is the, the obvious weak spot going forward for attacking teams. How would you get at Liverpool if you were challenging them? Yeah, it's something we mentioned in uh, one of our transfer podcasts the other week, wasn't it? I said that mm-hmm. Liverpool do need to invest in that. They just lack. Um, I, yeah, I agree with Miles. I think in terms of Trent, we've actually I think we've seen Southgate toy with him in midfield before, haven't we? I think we've put, he's yeah. played him in, in midfield. Yeah. Um, you know, which kind of makes sense, really, with kind of that's without speaking too much about England, the wealth of you know options that they have at right back for the likes of Reece James. Having Trent in a midfield position would probably work really well. And if Liverpool were to go into the market and obviously buy a full back, it might be a massive stroke for them, really. Mm. Uh, when you look at kind of the lack of options they have in there they've got a, a few midfielders are quite injury prone as well it seems yeah. to over the last year or two they don't really te- seem to have all of them there mm. together um a, a few of them have missed quite big chunks of the season and obviously that's not um, beneficial to them at all so i agree I, the, the worrying the scary thing is at man city have, you know they fought calvin phillips have got julian alvarez in and Haaland, it almost seems we forget about that business that they've done. They almost like it's mm. almost like done it really quietly, and there's still opportunities there for them to further invest. Mm. Often there's, there's murmurs around Bernardo Silva potentially going to Barcelona and more again today. So it's scary to think like what they could actually go out there and get, uh, yeah. as well as what they already have, and you know, it's, gonna, it's okay. gonna be going to be difficult for for those teams at the top that have got to compete with I think the fact that they've they've sold willingly the players they've sold as well to direct rivals which we've mentioned before as well is such a flex about their strength and depth isn't it it really is but they've quietly gone about replacing them and their net spend is going to be pretty minimal the fact that Haaland only costs what he did is, is means that their budget is not going to be impacted hardly at all so financial fair play is no longer a question because they've offloaded some expensive wages as well. So, yeah, smart business by City that's kind of gone under the radar a bit and they've got stronger without us even realising it, which is which is crazy to think with the players they've lost. But transfers, staying on that subject, Miles, I'm going to go to you because I know what you're going to say. Transfer news this week that's really stood out. Give us your bit, give us your take. It's got to be Paolo Dybala, surely. Well, yeah, I mean, that's been happening for the last couple of weeks, but watching his unveiling and then him getting an assist against Spurs in the week as well, it's just fantastic. He, he's someone that really encapsulates what Rome wants in a footballer. And he's creative. He's a flair player. He's a big name. And you saw how the fans responded. And Insane. This, this really could be the kind of Mourinho second season joy that we've seen a few times. And I'm really looking forward to it as long as the third season doesn't follow as well. But <laughs> no, Roma have done fantastic business without actually spending too much. It looks like Wanya Aldum going to join him there now as well. They're yeah. still talking to Andrea Bellotti as a backup for Tammy Abraham if Shmorigov moves on. It's, it's, it's some great great business they brought Matic in which you you might laugh at as United fans but it, he's going to do a good job for Mourinho you know that and in Syria it's the right sort of pace for him and as things stand they're keeping hold of all their big players from last year Pellegrini, Zaniolo and Abraham so that's yeah. fantastic adding Dybala to that squad is is absolutely amazing I'm really excited to see what he does for Roma and, and where he fits the system because he, he likes to play just behind the striker, which is kind of Zaniolo's spot. And Pellegrini also likes to get forward as well. So it'd be very attacking for Mourinho to play all three behind Abraham. But he did it against Spurs. So we'll we'll see what system he like he lines up with. Uh, Mourinho turning over a new leaf, isn't he? He's getting this new lease of life in Rome and he's suddenly stacking with a talented attacking team. It's insane. Loves it. And and Nemanja Matic and Gigi, Gigi Wijnaldum as well, which uh, balances it out nicely. But no, and wicked maybe Eric Bailly. 
<laughs> maybe every buyer, yeah. I mean, good business all around. I think where else in Serie A is looking like they're going to be strengthening so far this season, Miles? I haven't seen a lot of what teams have done. I've seen Napoli sort of sliding slightly, but who's actually improving? I, I'm a bit worried about this, if I'm totally honest, because I haven't seen much improvement across the league. A lot of players are starting to leave again. I mean, if you look at Juventus, they've brought in Angel Di Maria and Paul Pogba. Pogba's now confirmed that he's going to be injured for yeah. at least two to three months. And Di Maria is obviously ageing. And then they sell the lit, which is, is a really frustrating one. It looks like they're also in the process of cancelling Aaron Ramsey's contract. They haven't yeah. decided whether Morata's coming back or not yet. So Juve have got a lot of gaps to fill and Chiesa is still injured. So that looks a worry. AC Milan have talked about a lot of business, but we've not seen a lot of it happen yet. Mm. Obviously, they've brought Origi in, but there's still talk of Hakim Ziyech. That's not happened. I wonder whether that will by the end of the window. Inter Milan, probably the biggest winners. They got Lukaku back, but they've signed Mkhitaryan as well. Mm. But doing that stopped them from signing Dybala and gave him to Roma, basically. Which I've seen a lot of Roma fans praising Edin Dzeko for refusing to leave Inter Milan after joining them from Roma, meaning that they couldn't sign Dybala and Roma did. So it's been nice. <laughs> and yeah, like you say, Napoli, they, they've still got players to hold on to. Victor Osimhen looks like he's probably going to stay now. But they've lost Insigne and they've confirmed Mertens has left now. So there's yeah. a lot of work to be done in the league. But that really... The exciting thing for me is I, I genuinely think that opens it up for, for Mourinho to try and have a title charge this year. Wow, Which would be thought? incredible for Roma if they could even be yeah. in the conversation this year. I think well, winning silverware to... last season has really helped the momentum, hasn't yeah. it? So you never know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Dave, any transfer business closer to home that you've seen that stood out for you? Any rumours still, still happening that you think are going to change the game at all? Um... It's not really, is there? It's pretty quiet. Yeah, it's been quiet. I mean, I'm still obviously keeping a close eye on United and wondering what they're going to do. I mean, the the fact that it's it's been left until you know the last week, a week before the new season begins, and we've signed potentially you know one starter, maybe two in Ericsson and uh, in the Sandro market. <laughs> Um, obviously Tyrell Malassia and one so two starters and a backup mm. and what we needed at the start of the window it's just so frustrating for me I actually um, wouldn't be surprised if Malassia started games I genuinely wouldn't be surprised if, it looks like Tellez is going to leave apparently Sevilla are sniffing around him I mean you never know with Luke Shaw but I actually wouldn't be surprised if we saw Malassia start yeah. in the first game of the season oh, yeah I mean from what I've seen of him so far in preseason, it looks, you know, it looks like a really good acquisition yeah. for them as well. Um, but it's just not an area that we really needed to address, assuming that Luke Shaw does, you know, return to the form that we saw him in. Yeah. In the in the season um, before last, and we also need a midfielder or two. Still not addressed that issue. The the young situations ongoing. Um. It's been going on and on for the last three months or so, and we we lack quality in you know attacking areas. It looks like Ronaldo's been today. So, I mean, it's just frustrating really because we just we've had not you know we've had half decent preseason. We got the play obviously ten half got the players in early. We look looks like we've adju we've adapted quite well to the system, the football we want to play at, which is promising. But I mean, the club just haven't really um, helped him in. You know, in that regard, mm. that he wanted. Um, surprise, surprise. Not really. Um... <laughs> Do you know what though? I think with the way that transfers in general have worked since COVID, and you look at the amount of free transfers that have happened this summer that would yeah. have just never happened before. I do wonder whether a lot of clubs are waiting for, for the end of the window. Because all of a sudden, you're in a much stronger position. If you look at the likes of... Dybala's a perfect example. For Juventus to have lost Dybala on a free, and Man United to have lost someone like Paul Pogba on a free, clubs are going to be really nervy of letting players wear their contract down, get to January and negotiate free deals elsewhere. So all of a sudden, the last week of the window, when players like Yuri Tielemans are running their contract down, 
clubs can go in with much smaller fees and say it's this or nothing. Yeah. And and you'll panic. And I think we'll see a lot. I think it'll be a really busy deadline day this year. I think I will see a lot of that. And I think Man United in particular will, will be quite busy. If the young happens, mm. I think it will happen very, very late in the window. But I, I yeah. still stand by the fact that I don't think it will happen. No, I do think um, we said previously that Ronaldo is probably staying, isn't he? In all likelihood, I can't see him getting a move anywhere, Cristiano. So he's, I don't know, he, he's an enigma, isn't he? Really, he's just so driven to succeed individually that any time he wastes now playing in a competition like the Europa League, he feels like it's kind of a waste of his career. And he wants to obviously finish in the Champions League, he wants to keep playing there for as long as he possibly can. So I understand why he wants to leave, but. Are United going to continue the season with him, Dave? Or can you see them lining up a replacement now? We do need a striker anyway, really, don't we? It looks like we're putting all our eggs in Anthony Martial's basket to try and make sure that he's the, the leading striker. And who would have thought that a year or so ago? You know, that's mental. So is Ronaldo staying? And if so, what kind of role will he play? Oh, I don't doubt that he, you know, he wishes he had the opportunity to go to a, another Champions League club. Um, yeah one that obviously will be contending for the Champions um, But it just seems as though clubs aren't interested for whatever reason, you know, finances, his age, um, the fact that they're going to have to pay United probably a fee because United aren't going to let him go on the free, uh, which is completely understandable, mm. considering they paid about 15 million, was it, last year. So um, all of those... Factors, yeah, he's going to be at the club, I think. Uh, so he, he will start games, let's be honest. Uh, yeah. He's, he's still a very good, very good player to have. Lethal in you know, around the box, as we've seen. So if we want someone to score goals, he's going to be the man for us. So it would be, be worrying if, if he did go because there's not really, there is a lack of um, strikers out there, in, in my opinion, who can kind of come in and an immediate impact. A lot of young strikers, a lot of talented strikers, it's been linked yeah. to Marks and Jimmy Sesco um, from Red Bull Salzburg. So mm. he's one I think they're the monitoring, but yeah, it's going to be difficult for anyone to come in and make an immediate impact. Whether, um, whether he stays or goes, it seems like United should be looking for a number nine because even if he stays, mm. this is the last year of his contract. They've obviously got a plus one option, but by then, you're talking about a, a much older striker. Mm -hmm. You've lost Cavani. Obviously, Greenwood's not around anymore. So, Ronaldo and Marshall are your only number nines, right? So, yeah. it seems like that would be a really obvious place to, to try and do some business. Obviously, Rashford can play there, but I think we'll see him on the wing this season. I heard a really interesting take elsewhere, actually, that I wonder what, what you guys think about. Borja Mayoral has just left Real Madrid today. After Benzema, they only have Mariano, who looks like he's also on his way out. They missed out on Mbappe. Benzema's obviously getting older. Ronaldo wants a club where he can be a big name and get some success and compete in the Champions League. Do we see a late bid from Real Madrid to try and bring him back there? Because it's about they, they haven't been linked with anyone else. And they no. missed out on Mbappe, so they could do with a good press. To be fair, they might have the funds set aside that they had for Mbappe, earmarked for no one so far. You know, yeah. they've not brought in any massive, massive names, have they? So, it's and worse Bale's idea. gone. It's yeah. The Bale wages are gone. The Isco wages are gone. And if you remember last year, it looked like Ronaldo was going to Man City and Man United just wouldn't allow that to happen and brought him in. Now there's a lot of talk of Ronaldo to Atletico Madrid. Do you not think that Real Madrid might react exactly the same? Maybe. Do you know what? But he's ruled it out categorically last season, didn't he? He's like, I'm not going back there. That chapter's been closed. The Real Madrid love story is, is, is you know, is, is preserved as it is, um, in his words. So, you know, I don't think you can ever say never, but um, mm. he's kind of already said no, hasn't he? Another, mm. another transfer though, that I was going to ask about, because you asked me about business in Italy and then what about closer to home, a good link so that Dave, obviously, you touted someone for Chelsea, and now West Ham have signed him. What, what do you guys think of uh, Skamaka going to West Ham and then finally getting another striker? Go on, Dave, you first. I think for the money, it's actually potentially a really good deal for them. Um, mm. And if you're looking at the downside of it, potential downsides, if he doesn't quite acclimatise to the Premier League, he's shown he's well, well capable of scoring goals in your 
um, we saw last um, he's still relatively young um, yeah. side I think it's a it was a I wouldn't say a risk well potential risk but one well worth taking for West Ham and like you mentioned Miles obviously it's been a long while since they had a, a striker really um, a proper striker in there who's kind of led the line was it Chicharito is probably one of the, the last ones that they well they had maybe. Haller didn't they but he just he didn't really Haller. cut it yeah, the last one who's come in and really scored goals was probably Chicharito, and he wasn't even bought as a oh, great. Really. Um, but and Ancevich, to... maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. A controversial figure, um, to say the least. But, yeah, I, I think um, I think West Ham have done, done, obviously done their homework, and for them, I think he's a, he's a real, real good, uh, good purchase, and one yeah. let's hope if he can adjust to the to the Premier League, he might be the one. For, he might be a one uh, for the uh, fancy uh, football teams. So uh, I'm thinking about it, I, I think, think he's built um, for the Premier League. I was going to say exactly the same. Yeah, I think yeah. His, his his finishing's fantastic as well. I think West Ham don't struggle to create chances, and he's he's the perfect kind of player to sort of finish them off. I think that's I think that's great business for them. Yeah, yeah. one for the future. Right. And I think he could have an instant impact as well. And the PSG were after him as well. So mm-hmm. he's got a profile that interests bigger teams than West Ham. I think they've had a real coup signing him. I really do. My only worry is David Moyes does not have a very good track record at managing number nines. He, he, he doesn't seem to get the best out of them very often. And I hope that we don't see a player that's as talented as Skamaka who's really come into the the big part of his career now where he's going to lead the line for Italy, it looks like. He had a great season last year and he could have made a, a big move. And he's he's made one to England, which I think is is really an interesting step. I really hope it doesn't go to waste because I think he's a fantastic player. Yeah. Well, potential punt for top scorer, maybe. Who knows? Um, <laughs> those guys are actually talking about such issues very soon on the pod. So look out for our season previews in the very near future before the season kicks off excitingly next weekend, um, which I can't wait for. I'm actually buzzing for the start of this new season. So many different variables, so many new players added. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. If you want to catch our predictions on who's going to win what and who's going to finish where, please do stay tuned. Please do hit like and subscribe right now so you can see everything that we think about the, the, the coming season, good, bad and ugly, and look back at it in nine months' time and just laugh. Like we did last <laughs> season, pretty much. Um, that was fun. But um, I think we've exhausted all our transfer news this time, Dave and Miles. It's been great talking to you both and having you back, and great to have that dynamic back. England are European champions in something, which is great. Um, it came home. News. It did come home, and the women <laughs> had to do it for us. So thank you to the Lionesses for making all of the nation super proud. And uh, roll on the new season. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks for watching. See you later.